last time uh, we talked about comets and collisions. So one big event happened in 1994. So there was a comet that was named Shoemaker-Levy. So it's named after the two scientists, you know, who predicted that uh, that comet will collide with Jupiter. And it was very well covered by the media. Everyone was excited. So they really reported the event. So 1994. And the comet collided in Jupiter. So they could, um, why, why was it a big deal? Because it was an international event. So all, all the teams for all over the world, they, they were uh, observing what was happening. And when I say observing, it means collecting data in visible light and infrared. And they were analyzing how much energy was delivered to Jupiter. So it was the first time that such a collision was observed in the solar system. And then it's, um, it's a, it's, it was like a wake up call to understand uh, that we should um, check on all those objects. It's called near Earth, Earth objects that might collide with Earth, right? And then what else was interesting is that the, the comet, when it collided with uh, Jupiter, it, it took the atmosphere of Jupiter and mixed it up. So it was a great opportunity to analyze what's in, in depth, right? What is inside that atmosphere. So it was all over the news. At the time, here I had a paper, but uh, I don't know what happened to it. I have a video to show you that it was in the news here. I think this, this was the news written at the time, 1994. Astronomers have witnessed five massive explosions on the planet Jupiter as fragments from the Shoemaker-Levy collided with the planet. Larger explosions are expected later this week. They called it the biggest explosion in the solar system for hundreds of years. Half an hour after the first comet fragment went in, the impact was still visible. The cloud of debris spread out for thousands of miles and was over a thousand miles high. The astronomers were jubilant. We're going to see things and we're going to learn a lot. That's the so good news. So one is Schumacher, the other one is Levy. That's why it's called Schumacher-Levy, those two scientists. And you see the debris of the comet colliding with uh, Jupiter. So it's the first time that was it was observed. Boom, and slam, and slam, ay, ay, ay. So a lot of energy delivered, a lot of hydrogen bomb in uh, energy content. So that will be in infrared. And you see all the heat being released from the impact. So the, the, the comet already had broken up in small pieces. So you see all the pieces, you know, slamming in, into the planet. So 1994, I remember because I was your age. I remember it was all over the news. Uh, let's see, I think I have another video somewhere. No? You don't see another video, oh, Shoemaker. So that's Jupiter. So that's the debris from the comet. So a comet is just a dirty snowball, okay? It's not homogeneous. It's a lot, just little pieces brought together by gravity and slam and slam and slam. Okay, so that was a big deal. Happened 1994. So they collected a lot of data. So you even see here the picture, all the atmosphere of, uh, I mean, the outmost atmosphere of Jupiter was like upside down. So it was a great opportunity to see what's hiding underneath. Okay, so it was a big event and people got excited about astronomy again. Um, 
there was another comet, which is called Schwarzman Washman. So it used to be a comet, like one piece, and little by little it broke down. It was broken down in small pieces. So one piece is called Schwarzman Washman 3. Another one is Washman Washman 1. So this one visits the Earth every 16 years. And um, it was also in the news because it uh, passed by the Earth in 2006. And then there was this French uh, pseudo scientist who said that the comet was sent maybe to destroy us again by alien. So it's, it's another UFO enthusiast. And he wrote a book about it. So people kind of got scared of that. And then when nothing happened in 2006, so then he said, oh, now the, the alien are not mad at us anymore. So maybe, I don't know, there was a change of geopolitics at the time. So the alien were not mad anymore. But anyway, you can uh, search him. Uh, I think he's French, given his name, Eric Julien. He's like a typical French name. And you have another comet here. So this this comet here okay, is part of the Centaurs. Do you remember the Centaurs? is a group of comets between Jupiter and um, Neptune. And they are not very well known. So you see here you have those little comets here, Jupiter and Neptune. And I think I have a video. Is it a video here? No, that's just giving you the orbit. You see you have Jupiter here, June. And then you're supposed to have a video. Do we have a video? Do you see a video? I think, oh, here.
that's interactive. It's very dynamic. And uh, the, the orbit is, let's, see, let's look at my picture here. Okay, it's between Jupiter and Saturn, not, not Neptune, sorry. Yeah. So that's the comet with a lot of volcanoes. Okay, so again, beware of pseudoscience. Sometimes they just, uh, it's an opportunity to scare people, but so far it did not happen. Okay, but sometimes you have very close call. So some of them could have their name on it. So this one happened 2004. You see the orbit, so it's part of the near, near Earth object. And luckily it missed us, 2004, and it was very close because the distance between Earth and the Moon is relatively small in, in the scale of the solar system, but lucky for us, it missed us. So hit us, it has to be at the same place at the same time. So some of them we can predict, maybe we can try to deflect the object, okay? I, I told you about a mission and it's possible, but some of them we cannot even see them, okay? Because they are on the other side, the, the sun doesn't shine on them, so they are dark. So it's very hard to predict when, when they're gonna hit. So this one has a great name, Tutatis. So Tutatis, I think it was a god, uh, ancient god, not sure. Maybe it's like Jupiter. I don't know. Do you know? No, you don't know the god. Not this one. Not this one. I don't. So Tutatis um, also missed us. Two thousand four. So this one was missed by more distance. So four times the distance uh, to the moon between Earth and the moon. Looks like a big uh, potato. So the. The big planets here, like especially Jupiter, it could be benefit or it could be um, dangerous in, in the sense that because they provide a lot of pull from gravity, a lot of tug, they can deflect some of the comets or some of the asteroids to the Earth, right? They can disturb their orbit. And sometimes it could be good because it can deflect it away from the Earth. So it could be deflecting to the Earth or away from the Earth. So some people think that it's possible that we owe life to those planets because maybe in one of those comets here or asteroid, maybe you had like the seed of for life and, and even even enough snow and enough uh, water to, to bring life to Earth. That's one theory. Not sure, but that's one theory. Okay, so maybe we owe life on Earth um, to Jupiter, because it could be that it deflected a comet that hit the Earth, and that comet could have the seed for life. Maybe bacteria or microorganisms, that's one theory, there is no proof for it. Okay. And then I have found very nice, very nice movie. Uh, if I, oh, this one. So this one comes from a channel, YouTube channel that I highly recommend. It's called Veras, Veratision, Vera, Ver, Veritation, Veritation. And, um, it's going to talk, I think it's going to talk about uh, an event that happened in Russia not, not long ago, a few years ago. So there was a meteorite. It didn't hit Russia, it didn't hit, hit the town because everything disappeared in the atmosphere because of the friction and the heat. But it produced a shock wave that broke windows and people were at the windows, you know, looking at the sky, looking at this meteorite, and many of them were um, hurt. And they didn't see it coming. This video was sponsored by KiwiCo. More about them at the end of the show.
On February 15, 2013, over Chelyabinsk, Russia, an asteroid heavier than the Eiffel Tower slammed into the atmosphere. And then, 30 kilometers above the ground, it exploded. This violent event was brighter than the sun, but so high up that it was silent. For a full 90 seconds after the blast, which only made the devastation worse. So you see all these videos of people, look at, look at what was that? They see the, the smoke trail in the sky, and, oh, that's amazing. And then, you know, just when you think nothing's gonna happen, the shockwave hits and it blows out the windows. Thousand people got glass in their face and their eyes because they're looking through the windows. The shockwave damaged thousands of buildings and injured 1,500 people. What makes the Chelyabinsk incident kind of embarrassing is that the very same day, scientists had predicted that an asteroid would make a close flyby of Earth. And they were right. 16 hours after Chelyabinsk, a similar-sized asteroid, known as Duende, came within 27,000 kilometers of Earth's surface. That's closer than satellites in geosynchronous orbit. But while they correctly predicted this close approach, they completely missed the unrelated asteroid that exploded over Russia. And the truth is, this happens all the time. We're really not that good at detecting asteroids before they hit us. Since 1988, over 1,200 asteroids bigger than a meter have collided with the Earth. And of those, we detected only five before they hit, never with more than a day of warning. With all our technology and all the telescopes across the Earth, not to mention the ones in space, why do we struggle to detect dangerous asteroids before they strike? What are the chances that a big asteroid will hit, wiping out most, if not all, life on Earth? And if we saw one coming, what could we do about it? Asteroids are the leftover debris from when our solar system formed. Four and a half billion years ago, rocks and dust clumped together into molten protoplanets. Inside, heavy elements, metals like iron, nickel, and iridium, sank into the core, leaving lighter silicate minerals on the surface. Some of these protoplanets grew into the planets we know today, but many more collided with each other, breaking into pieces. These pieces continued orbiting the sun and smashing into each other and breaking into even smaller fragments. These became the asteroids, which is why some of them are rocky, loose conglomerates of gravel-sized rocks called rubble piles, and others from the cores of planetesimals are mostly metal. So this is, uh, this is an iron meteorite, and essentially it's a piece of a core of a small, planetary body, like a, basically a small planet that um, formed four and a half billion years ago, differentiated, so the core material fell out. And then this thing was smashed apart by a collision with another asteroid. That's the oldest thing you'll ever see. Most of the asteroids have stable orbits between Mars and Jupiter in the main asteroid belt, but some have made their way closer to Earth, and these are known as near-Earth objects. They are of greatest interest to us because of the threat they pose. In his last book, Stephen Hawking considered an asteroid impact to be the greatest threat to life on Earth. But finding asteroids is difficult for several reasons. Most are spotted by ground-based telescopes. So what you do is you take a sequence of pictures, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, and you look for essentially a moving dot. And it's moving because it's orbiting around the sun, whereas the stuff far away, the stars and galaxies, or not. But you have to look carefully. Asteroids are not very big. They range from meters up to kilometers in size. And in the vast expanse of space, rocks like that just don't stand out. And even the small ones can be damaging. The Chelyabinsk meteor was only around 20 meters in diameter, roughly the width of two school buses. Plus, asteroids are rough and dark. They only reflect around 15% of the light that hits them. So our best chance to see them is when they're fully illuminated by the sun. And that's why over 85% of the near-Earth asteroids we've detected were found in the 45 degrees of sky directly opposite the sun. 
This is called the opposition effect, and it means there are likely more near-Earth and potentially hazardous asteroids that haven't been detected yet. Any asteroid approaching from the direction of the Sun just can't be seen. This is exactly what happened with Chelyabinsk. So far, we have detected and cataloged a million asteroids, the vast majority of which are in the main asteroid belt. But 24,000 are near-Earth objects, ones that we need to keep a particularly close eye on, because even once you've detected an asteroid, it's hard to tell if it will hit the Earth. So if you just discover an object and you only have data from a few days, then you can't really tell where it's going to go because you're trying to take this little arc of motion and predict it far into the future. So what you need is observations over years and years. But even if you have perfect observations of an asteroid, there's kind of a fundamental limit to how far in the future you can predict. And that's because uh, a couple of effects. But one is that, you know, they're not just orbiting the sun with no other influence. All of the planets have gravity, and all of the planets are pulling on uh, near-Earth asteroids and can change the orbit significantly. Oh, that's so incredible. there is something called dynamical that's chaos, really which basically means after a certain amount of time, you don't know where the asteroid is going to be. And in practice, what that means is we can't do any work more than 100 years in the future. So the maximum time you can predict with any accuracy at all where a body will be is about 100 years. And this is pretty important, because we know with certainty, if one does hit, the results will be dramatic. This is Behringer Crater in Arizona. It's well, named after mining engineer Daniel You see here, that's the visitor center. So it gives you an idea of the size of the impact, right? Behringer, who was the first to suggest it was formed by a meteorite impact. The prevailing view, even up until the 1950s, was that it was created by volcanic activity. But Behringer was convinced it was the site of an iron meteorite impact. So in 1903, he staked a mining claim and began drilling for the metallic meteorite, which he believed to be worth more than a billion 1903 dollars. Yeah, so people are motivated by money, right? So they thought, hey, we can get some iron for free, basically. So they started to drill in the bottom of the crater and found nothing. And then they started to do other exploratory drills, and this went on for years and, and decades. They started to drill sideways. Somebody said, you know, maybe it came in from an angle, which it did, and maybe the iron is, is not under the middle, but maybe it's over there under the wall. So he was doing drilling. If you go there, you can see the drills now. He was drilling around the wall, he found nothing. So what they didn't realize is when you have an impact at high speed, it's not like you're throwing a stone into a brick wall, you know, and it makes a hole and sticks in there, or just bounces off. It's explosive. It's like totally explosive. So the kinetic energy of the projectile comes in maybe 30 kilometers per second. The kinetic energy of the projectile is big enough to completely vaporize the projectile. It turns it into a gas. And that gas is super hot and super high pressure. And it explodes and it blows out the crater. So the projectile doesn't really exist after the impact. I mean, little pieces can survive. But this 50 meter body was basically obliterated. So were, he was looking for something that did not exist. He spent 27 years mining the crater, drilling down to a depth of over 400 meters. But what he was searching for had vaporized on impact 50,000 years earlier. The 50-meter asteroid, not that much bigger than Chelyabinsk, released the energy equivalent of 10 megatons of TNT. That's over 10 megaton of TNT, right? 600 times the energy of the Hiroshima bomb. So the thing that one most closely resembles a meteorite bomb. impact About. is a very large nuclear explosion. This is the actual size of the T-Rex skull. And I thought, this is such a cool thing, I gotta have it. So I bought the T-Rex. The dinosaurs were wiped out by a 10 kilometer sized asteroid uh, that hit about 65 million years ago. So above a critical size, which is probably a couple of kilometers, uh, an impactor delivers so much energy that it has a global effect. So essentially it launches a whole bunch of debris into suborbital trajectories. So the ejector goes around the Earth, falls back into the Earth all over, even on the other side of the planet from where the impact occurred. What that means is the whole sky lights up with wall-to-wall -wall meteors. 
So you can imagine the sky turning from, you know, a nice blue day like today into essentially um, a red hot glow, like being inside a toaster oven. So the first effect of this impact, apart from the initial blast near, near where the actual impact occurred, the first effect is the sky turns into a great source of heat and it cooks everything on the ground. So these guys were basically cooked. Cooked uh, alive. Cooked alive as they're walking around. The only animals that had a chance were the ones living in tunnels under the ground or maybe um, in the water. And they were able to, to come back and take over without having to deal with the dinosaurs as a, a major obstacle. What are our chances that Earth gets hit by a, another 10? So that was done uh, recently, right? I think the Russian event happened in 2020. You might want to check. I'm not sure around there. So it's a kind of recent video obviously because he has the mask. Kilometer or bigger asteroid. In your lifetime, assume you live to be uh, 100 years old, you have a 10 kilometer impactor like the KT extinction event every 100 million years or something like that. So the probability of getting it in one year is one in 100 million. So you have one in a million chance of dying from a 10 kilometer impactor. But because we know that there are no 10 kilometer impactors, um, with a path that intersects the Earth for the next hundred years, your chance of dying from that is actually zero. So work down already has reduced that down, you know, from one in a million to, to nothing. So the good news is there won't be another dinosaur-style extinction event in our lifetimes. But there are exponentially more asteroids of smaller sizes. For every 10 kilometer asteroid, there are roughly a thousand one kilometer asteroids, and they're still capable of doing a lot of damage. One or two kilometers um, is capable of causing local but massive damage. So that means, you know, instead of wiping out the entire world, you would wipe out the equivalent of some European country, like France or Germany, to mention two of my favorites. So you would obliterate those countries with the impact of a one or two kilometer size body. Do we know about all the one to two kilometer bodies that could hit us? We think that we know 90 something percent, maybe 98 percent of those bodies have been identified and we have their orbits and we can make reasonable predictions for the next 10 years or something about where they'll be. And we seem to be okay at the moment. But you know, uh, what about the ones that are just a little bit less than a kilometer? What about the ones that are 800 meters? That's still pretty pretty savage if it hits. And this is possibly where the greatest threat of asteroids remains. A few hundred meters is large enough to obliterate a large city, but small enough that we haven't detected them all yet. We're missing a lot of 100 meter sized projectiles. And those guys are big enough to cause substantial damage on the US depending on where they hit. So it could destroy a city? Yeah, it would knock down the buildings in the city. It would cause citywide fire. And um, if it hit the ground, it would uh, throw up ejecta that would come back down, rain on the ground, it would be high-speed ejecta that would obliterate a 100-kilometer zone uh, around it. And this could happen tomorrow? Well, it could, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we saw a big one coming, what's our best bet for, I mean, could we do anything about it? What would we do about it? Is no, there anything we can do to actively... No, there's, there's nothing we can do. I was on a committee that looked at that, okay, like 10 years ago. Like, what could we, what could we do? One option would be to try to bomb it. It's the standard thing. We don't know how that would work out. Even when you got it there, and even if you could explode it uh, on the surface or in the surface, it's not clear what you would do. Because typically what happens is you blow up a body and the fragments move out, they expand out, but not very quickly. And then gravity pulls them back together again. So it would reform as a rubble pile if it was not already a rubble pile to begin with, which it probably would be because of past impacts. So blowing up a rubble pile is something that we don't really know about. Another idea is you could attach, you could be all gentle, and attach a rocket to the asteroid and just try to push it aside. Let's nudge it aside. Instead of trying to blow it up, let's just push it gently aside so that it deflects it and it doesn't hit the Earth. The trouble is, when you work out the numbers, none of the rockets that we have can push it around enough. You would have to keep the rockets attached to the surface, which we don't know how to do. Remember, it's a rotating body for centuries to have a significant effect on the motion of the asteroid. So forget bombs, forget attaching rockets. Ablating the surface, basically you boil the surface with a laser. We don't have any lasers powerful enough and probably can't make lasers powerful enough uh, to do that from the Earth. We would have to take the lasers to the object, which is even more difficult. Uh, the idea that you could wrap an asteroid 
in cooking foil, aluminum cooking foil is another nice one. That may be a good one, the best one, uh, but it still doesn't really work because we don't know how to do that. We don't have a way to launch enough cooking foil to wrap up an asteroid and change its radiative properties, which would itself move the asteroid around. So the truth is, to be honest, we do not have a way now to deflect a kilometer-sized asteroid at all. That we could just, destroy a country. Yeah, we just don't have a way. And so, 10 kilometers? So, oh, 10 kilometers is, is absolutely a thousand times more hopeless. <laughs> so when, when we discussed this, you know, we, we had all these grand ideas, oh, we could do this and this, and none of them worked. We came down to the most basic idea, well, maybe if we could figure out where the asteroid is going to hit, like which city is it going to explode over, we can evacuate that city. And then we looked at the history of city evacuations, and we looked at cases, you know, where, for example, you have like a week's warning where some hurricane system is going to come in and flood a city. And, and evacuation uh, just doesn't work either. And the reason is very, very simple. Like going into a city, there are not that many freeways. Uh, if you have millions of people trying to get on a freeway, the first time a car breaks down, you, you block that freeway. So instantly you have millions of people trying to get out of the target zone and, and they won't be able to because all of the roads will be instantly blocked. So again, even that, even evacuation of a city is probably the most hopeful thing that we could try to do. Even that's really, really difficult because of the large numbers of people uh, involved. What I think all reasonable people would conclude is, let's do the thing that we can do first. So let's look for them. Let's do the surveys. Let's build the telescopes. Let's put this telescope in space. That will be a major contribution to understanding the threat from the asteroids. And then when we find a particular object that looks especially dangerous, then we can focus on it. We can focus everything we have on it, and we can begin to think seriously and with real motivation about ways to deflect it. Now, if you're concerned about the world ending in an asteroid impact, let me set your mind at ease. There are many other potential global catastrophes summarized in this map of doom made by my friend Dom over at Domain of Science. So if you want to see which of these horrible scenarios is likeliest to be our downfall, well, go check out the video on his channel. So it's not very uh, optimistic. See, I wanted to show you something else if I find. So they, they, they did try something like this. Okay, they sent the spacecraft and try to uh, deflect an, an asteroid and it kind of worked but it, did, it was not deflected much right but they are still working on it so we can stay optimistic okay any question so um wanted to, to tell you so not this coming friday the following friday there is no class right and now we're going to start talking about stars, finally. Okay, so we are done with the solar system. We're going to focus on stars. So you see all those stars come in different color and mass and, and uh, size. So the, the, the thing to remember is that the most important, um, so we're going to talk about the stellar parameters, right? which are intrinsic uh, properties of stars, the most important property of stars is the mass. Okay? And it will determine everything, even influence the chemical composition, even though the chemical composition of a star depends on the nursery cloud it was born from. So you start with a cloud of gas, dust and gas, and then maybe there was a supernova in a nearby uh, neighborhood. That supernova will uh, create a shock wave that will give a little kick inside that cloud of gas, and that gas start to collapse and a new star is born. So if you have a lot of materials available, then you can build a huge, huge, huge star. If you don't have much of material, then you will have a small star. Okay, so the largest star are the blue stars. 
and the small stars are the red stars. But mass of stars is the most important parameter because if you have a large mass, okay, so if the star has a large mass, that means gravity will be very strong. And because gravity will be very strong, it's squeezing the star together. It's going to increase the pressure and the temperature. And if the temperature is large and the pressure is large, the metabolism will be high as well. So it means the star will burn its fuel very quickly and it will run out of fuel very quickly as well. So that means that the large stars okay, will have a shorter life than the small star. So a star is always in equilibrium between gravity, try to squeeze the star, right, to make it collapse, and then you have pressure pushing outward. So that pressure comes from all those protons and neutrons you know, in, inside inside the star, they jingle and they shake, and so they have a thermal motion, so like a gas. When you have a gas and you try to compress it, it's going to resist, right? You're going to provide pressure. And uh, like in a tire, in the tire of your car, if you if you increase, you know, the, the gas inside, the pressure is going to increase. So it worked like that in a star, it's an equilibrium between gravity trying to collapse the car, the, the star, and the pressure pushing outward, right, from the thermal motion. So it's an equilibrium, okay, and it's called hydrostatic equilibrium. And that equilibrium will last for the main life of the star, okay, and then when it's about to die, something happens, you know, it can collapse, it can make a supernova, so we will talk about it, right? So the mass of the star will determine the life of a star. So very large star will have a high metabolism, so they burn their fuel very quickly, so they run uh, out of fuel very quickly, so they die young. So that's the story of live hard and die young, Okay, the mass of the star will also determine the size, which means the radius. So that's another stellar parameter. So it's about proportional, right? Uh, if you multiply about, about, if you multiply the mass by 10, the size will be about multiplied by 10. So here we have a proportion. Another uh, stellar property that depends on the mass of stars is called luminosity. So what is luminosity? It's the oomph of a star, right? It's the power. How much energy is being emitted per unit second? So for example, if you have those old uh, light bulb, incandescent light bulb, you could buy a 100 watt light bulb. So that will be how much energy is being produced per unit second. So, of course, if the star is large, it has a very large uh, or, or large metabolism, so it's going to burn its fuel very quickly, so it's going to release a lot of energy per unit second, it has more power. So that will be the luminosity of a star. We'll talk also, we already talked about it, about temperature. So large star, they're going to be hot, Hotter, so they're going to have a peak wavelength more into the blue. Okay, so not only they're going to produce more energy per unit second, but the color will be into the blue. So blue stars are hotter than cold star. Okay, so we'll talk about that. How do we find the mass of stars? Is for um, uh, we, we use physics here, so most of the stars, they don't like to be single. Um, most of the stars, they come in two, in pair. Okay? At least 50% of stars, they have companion. So usually you have binary system, so two stars orbiting their common center of mass. You can have three, up to five, but it becomes very unstable. Right, so menage à trois can work, 
but more than Menage à Trois, it doesn't work very well. So, but most of the stars are in binary systems. So by, by observing those binary systems and applying physics law, okay, we can find the masses of stars. So we can use, for example, we can use um, conservation of momentum. We can use, you see, when you have the center of mass here, it's like a seesaw. So you have that mass here times this distance here equals that mass times that distance here. Maybe you you already uh, if if you if you if you have played with your little brother or sister or nephew you know someone smaller than you, and um, the 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 trick is for you to sit as close as to the center, and the lighter person will sit farther away, so it can be kind of an equilibrium. So that works exactly the same way. Okay, so if, if that star has three times less mass, that distance here will be much by by three. We use also Kepler's law. Okay, so Kepler's law give a relationship between how far it is from the center of mass and how long it takes to go around. So just playing with those equations, it's just algebra, it's not even a complex math, you can find the masses of stars, okay? Uh, you can use spectroscopy or you can use uh, direct observation. So what uh, binary systems look like, uh, I don't know where I am now, here, I am here. Binary system here looks like this. So you see you have two stars orbiting their common center of mass. You can have a line here okay, between, okay, you can make a line here, straight line. So this one is always opposite to that one with the center of mass here. So it works like a seesaw, right? So even if you have Jupiter and the sun, the sun wobble because of Jupiter, but the sun has such a large mass that the center of mass will be inside Jupiter. So that works not only with two stars, but a star or a planet also. Right? So this one is going to move faster because it has less mass, so less inertia. This one is moving slower because it has more mass, more inertia. Okay, so, but the tug is the same. Okay, Newton's third law says for every action you have a reaction, you cannot, be, you cannot pull without being pulled and you cannot pull more than you are being pulled. So the tug between them is the same. The consequence is not. This one has more inertia, so it's not going to move as fast as that one. So these are called binary systems. Any question? I'm a physics. <laughs> Probably so. I, I tend to, do, to to take tangent, but it's it's not hard to understand. Another stellar parameter is uh, chemical composition. So we talk about that. If you look at the light from a star, okay, and the light goes through some kind of prism, you see the rainbow here. So it's a continuum that you have, and so opposed to that, you have black lines. By looking at this QR code, you can tell what the star is made of, at least in the outmost uh, layers. So it will also depend on the mass, because more massive stars can cook heavier elements like silicon, carbon, magnesium, but it also depends from the nursery it was born from. So, for example, our sun was born from the leftover uh, of a supernova. So there was a big star exploded. So it spread out all heavy uh, elements. So there was a cloud of gas and dust, the leftover from the supernova. And inside that cloud of dust and gas, the sun was born. So it depends where, where it was born, right? The chemical composition it depends on the mass. Well, well uh, from, from the initial cloud of gas. So not only on the mass. Is that clear? Okay. And then uh, here, 
We'll talk about that next time. So we start an exciting unit about styles, which is the most in interesting stuff. Any question?